Koji vam je najdraži lik iz slavenske mitologije i zašto? I've always loved the um the god Velis, right? He's my favorite um because he's the god of poetry and of music and of cattle and it's all almost confusing how many things he's in charge of. And of course, he and the goddess Morana had a daughter together, um Baba Yaga, which is a lovely story. <laughs> Dobrodošli u razgovor s razlogom. Rođena je u Američkoj savjeznoj državi Teksas, a obožava slavinsku mitologiju. Iz generacije milenijaca, a napisala je roman o Prvom svjetskom ratu. Njezina trilogija Zimska noć bila je nominirana za prestižnu nagradu Hugo, a u Hrvatskoj je došla predstaviti svoje romane. Naša je gošća, književnica Catherine Arden. Hvala vam što ste s nama. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Rođeni ste u Teksasu, ali niste ostali zaljepljeni za zapadnu kulturu. Jako volite slavensku mitologiju. Pa otkud ta interes? Kako? Zašto? A very strange, actually, path. I, um, when I was 18 years old, I was in dance classes in Texas with a um, girl from Moscow, from Russia. And um, we became friends. And her family went back to Moscow. That was in 2006 um, for a visit. And I went with her. And I was so interested in, in this place, um, the, the literature, the language, the food, um, the weather even. It was very different from Texas that I decided to um, stay for a year. Um, this was after I finished my high school, we say in the States, but before university. And um, I decided to stay and um, learn Russian. And I did, I went to this Um, this place called the Pushkin Institute, and I spent a year um, learning Russian. And one part of learning was I, um, I read Pushkin aloud because the poetry gives you the stress on the words so you know which, which words, how to pronounce them. Um, and I fell in love with this poetry. And then many years later, um, I got a degree in Russian um, and also French. I did languages. I thought that I would use this kind of knowledge to write a book based on um, Slavic mythology and um, fairy tales because I, I love books based on fairy tales, but I had never read one based on sort of a Slavic fairy tale. So. U čemu je razlika između um, bajki koje su napisane eto, i koje su iz slavenske mitologije vezane u slavensku kulturu i ovih zapadnjačkih bajki? Kažete da li je to jako zanimljiva ta nekakva razlika koja postoji između jednih i drugih? The differences are fascinating to me because I have always felt like Western fairy tales, they have a different almost value system. Like the women, for example, in Western fairy tales, um, the heroines in fairy tales are very passive. Like Sleeping Beauty, she sleeps in a tower. Uh, Snow White also sleeps, a lot of sleeping um, <laughs> everywhere. But compare that to like Baba Yaga, in, a, in um, Slavic folklore or Vasilisa, uh, the beautiful um, women who, who act in their stories versus being passive. I also feel like um, Western fairy tales have this very like rigid notion of good and evil. Like there's the hero and the villain um, and the hero is brave and usually kind of warlike. Like he, he and he's a, he's a warrior fighter. He, he wins and he gets the girl and um, the bad guy is punished. Whereas um, in Slavic fairy tales, it's less clear. Sometimes, you know, the fool gets the princess, right? Or um, the lazy youngest son gets the princess. And it feels more, more ambiguous, the values. Like, and, and I find that so interesting and so complex. Omiljen imam je pisac Bulgakov, a roman majstor i Margarita. Na koji način je uopće Bulgakov utjecao na vaš rad? I love Mikhail Bulgakov. Like, a fantastic, fantastic writer. Um, I read him Sobachi Sertsa when I was just a heart of a dog, when I was um, first learning Russian. And then I picked up Master and Margarita later um, when I was sort of more, more able to understand it. And um, it's a perfect example of using the fantastical to say something true about the real world. Um, and in the case with Master and Margarita, he, he illustrates the hypocrisy and the, 
the, the fallen nature of 1930s Moscow um, by making the devil, right, the only one in this whole world who tells the truth. And it's such a wonderful, a wonderful juxtaposition of a real setting and a fantasy. And it's so funny and so um, agile and so interesting, but it also says true heartfelt things. And I'm so inspired by that ability to use the fantastical to say truth. The thing I like about fantasy and about horror is that they can say things about the world that realistic fiction can't say by itself. And especially with books based on mythologies or based on fairy tales, it almost feels like you're trying to take the stories people told themselves and mix that with their history to say something new about a time or a place. A koliko je teško uopće onda na takav način pisati kada morate krenuti od nečega što je izmišljeno, a da biste ipak napisali nešto što je vezano uz stvaran život, uz realnost? I mean, I wish it was easier. I, um, I always want my, my fantasy to say something true about my history. Um, I think they can work so well together. I think the danger is when you take history as this kind of like backdrop, just like for, for atmosphere. You know, like, oh, I'm going to have this, the, the sort of general atmosphere of this time and place and then have a fantasy story on top of it. Ideally, I want my fantasy to interact with the history and say something because um, if you take the myths and the legends and the fairy tales of a time and a place and mix them with the history of that place, I think it can say something interesting, especially with this book, um, which takes place during the First World War. I... Um, I struggled a lot for a long time to find a, a fantastical side that didn't feel completely silly. Knjiga je u hrvatskom prijevodu nazvana Pandemoni. To je bio i radni naslov uh, vašeg romana koji ste kao počeli pisati 2019. prije pandemije koronavirusa. Pa koliko je onda bilo proračanski kad je 2020. počela pandemija, a vi pišete knjigu koja se zove Pandemoni? Um, you know, it's funny because in 1918, there was a pandemic, um, the biggest the world had ever seen before this one, and um, during World War I. And it's funny that I was writing about a time that had a pandemic when we were having our own pandemic. And um, the title of Pandemonium refers to the, um, the capital city of hell in Paradise Lost, this um, poem by John Milton, this English poet. Um, In this poem, Satan falls from heaven, he finds himself in hell um, with all these fallen angels, and they build a city. And the city is called Pandemonium. And it was interesting because, at least in English, you have these two meanings of the word. You have chaos, right? And then you also have this particular place, this capital city in hell. And the novel is about hellscapes, um, both the fantastical kind and the man-made kind. And so that was why the title... Kroz roman se zapravo provlači ideja apokalipse i u, u cijeloj priči i vrag ima svoju ulogu. Koja je točno uloga vraga, zašto ste posegnuli za njim i zašto vam je bio važan u romanu? Well, so I knew I wanted to, I wasn't sure how to bring fantasy into this time period. And it seemed like the most obvious place to start was with the Bible. Just because everyone or many people fighting on the Western Front during the First World War, where Christians had read it, would be, that was a, a framework that they used um, to build their lives. And so I, I read the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, which is a very, a very fantastical book, right? It has the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It has angels and seals and hell open, all these just wild occurrences. And I, there was a quotation in there that really inspired me. Um, the prophet says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old had passed away. Um, and I read this and I thought, that's interesting. Did the prophet see a new hell too? Because people did. Um, and it occurred to me that so many writers had described World War I in apocalyptic language. They talked about Armageddon, right? Um, And that one change that we saw between the 19th century and the 20th century is that if you ask 
a 19th century person to describe a hellscape, they'd probably describe a fantastical place. They'd describe Pandemonium and Paradise Lost, or Dante's Nine Circles, or go further back, they'd describe the underworld in the Odyssey, right? But if you ask a 20th century person to describe a hellscape, they'd probably describe a real place, right? They might mention Hiroshima, they might mention Auschwitz, they might mention the Battle of Passchendaele in 1917. And it felt like that was this essential change between the 19th and 20th centuries. And then I asked myself, okay, in a hellscape made by people, what does the devil do? Because in the 19th century, the romantic idea of Satan, this character is very concerned with with individual people, right? Their, their vices, their weaknesses, their flaws, their desires. This character uses those things to make them fall. Whereas in the 20th century, um, in, a, in a modern battlefield, in sort of a mechanized war, none of that matters, right? It doesn't matter if you're brave or cowardly or nice or, or anything, it just, you're just a body, right, in this kind of mechanized war space. And so I asked myself, what would a villain who cares so much about individual people do in this place where people don't really matter? Jeste li pronašli odgovor na to pitanje? <laughs> I što biste vi rekli, je li vrag taj koji nas navodi da činimo nešto loše ili je naša ljudska priroda ta koja nas nagoni na zlo? I found my answer to the question. I don't think there is a right answer to this question, but um, I think the, um, the epigraph, the opening quotation in this book is a quote by a, an author from the time period named Arthur Machen. And the quote um, in Latin is, a diabolus incarnatus s, a homo factus s. And the devil was incarnated and was made man. And that kind of speaks to what I was thinking at the time, which is that it comes from people, right? People um, create like the evil in the world. At the same time, the First World War was so big, it was beyond any one person's evil or goodness. It was the system that people had made, but it was bigger than a person. And so it's impersonal. It's, 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 it's scarier to me than like the devil because nobody's in charge of it. It's just there, right? Ono što me se dojmilo je da u knjizi na neki način ne pokazujete rat kao samo kontrast, kao nešto crno-bijelo, odnos isključivo saveznika i neprijatelja, nego nam pokazujete da postoje različite uloge i te uloge na različite načine isprepleću. Zašto vam je ta poruka bila važna? In the novel, the enemy is the war. The war itself. The war is a system. I don't think on individual level between armies or between soldiers you can say that one person's the hero and one person's the villain because everyone's the hero to themselves, right? And nobody fighting in the war on the ground wanted to be there. Maybe a few psychos, but mostly nobody wanted to be there, right? And so it's about people and how the individual human sort of soul fares against something as inhuman as war. Um, so it's not about people versus people, it's about man versus system, I guess, in a way. Mlada ste osoba, mi ćemo ove godine obilježiti 110. obljetnicu početka Prvog svjetskog rata. Zašto vam je uopće to razdoblje bilo zanimljivo? Zašto ste odlučili pisati o Prvom svjetskom ratu? I što biste rekli, na koji način je on promijenio svijet, civilizaciju, kulturu, pa u konačnici čovjeka? I was fascinated by how strange it was because during this war, the 19th century collided violently with the 20th century and you had all these strange um, juxtapositions, combinations, right? You have a war where you can fire a gun, an artillery and, and fire it 50 miles, you know, but you can't talk to the guy in the next trench because there's no radio. Right? You have messenger pigeons still. Um, people were trying experimental suits of armor against machine guns. You have cavalry charging tanks. It was so very strange. Nurses wearing corsets. And the world changed so fast. Like in 
um, the Wright brothers flew the first powered aircraft, I believe, and by 1916, you have, you have combat aircraft, right? That's, that's not even a decade. And I was so interested in how strange the world must have felt to the people living in it and how fast it was changing and how dramatically it was changing. And I tried to capture a little bit of that in my novel, but I was so intrigued um, by, the, by the surreal quality of, of this time period. Um, and also how I remember reading when I was doing my research about how the war's landscapes inspired the writer um, J.R.R. Tolkien, for example, um, the, the Mordor, the, his, his dark country and the area around it, um, his descriptions of that place come straight off the Western Front. The, the smoke, the bad water, all these things, he lived through them himself. He was a soldier. I, I was just interested. And I, as a writer, you have to just pick what interests you and go for it because you spend years on a project. And so at the end of the day, it just has to be what interests me. And you, you hope that others are interested too. Zanimljivo da ste roman počeli sa uh, događajem koji se dogodi u kanadskom Halifaxu 1917. Jedna eksplozija o kojoj ja moram priznati osobno ništa nisam znala. Uh, recite nam malo što se to dogodilo u Halifaxu i s kakvim posljedicama. Absolutely. I, I live not far from Halifax. I live in Vermont, which is in the northeast United States. And um, they have a very wonderful museum in Halifax of like ships because they're, they're, they're a seafaring city. And one wing, one part of the museum, is dedicated to this Halifax explosion, which really happened. Um, it was December of 1917, and a ship from, I think, New York, um, loaded with explosives, with munitions, um, went to Halifax in order to then convoy over to Europe for the war. And the ship had been packed with um, a layer of high explosive um, a layer of, of cotton for guns, and then a layer of benzene, gasoline, very packed very tightly. And it was in Halifax Harbor. It collided with a, I think, a tugboat. Um, and the benzene on deck caught fire. So it burned, and then since the boat was a giant bomb, essentially, it blew up. And it was the largest non-nuclear explosion in history. It flattened Halifax. Um, there was these giant firestorms. It was so terrible that um, a few decades later, during the Manhattan Project, um, they sent researchers to Halifax to ask what happens to a city when that kind of explosion hits it. And I was so fascinated by this relatively unknown historical event um, because um, my main characters in this book are Canadians. They're both from Halifax. And to North Americans in general, we say World War. We say World War I, we say World War II, but it doesn't feel like the war happened in our world, right? It happened elsewhere. It happened in Europe. It happened in North Africa. It happened in Asia. And so this one moment, it almost felt like the war crept across the ocean and, and landed at the doorstep of a North American city. Um, and my main character is a combat nurse who has been fighting in France for the, the three years of the war. She's sent home after an injury and the explosion happens. And it feels like to her that the war followed her home. Um, and I wanted to give the sense of a conflict that nobody could escape. And this explosion felt like a good way to do that in the novel. Kad kažete rat daleko od kuće za Amerikance, sad se događa rat u Ukrajini. U Europi se ponovno mnogo govori o opasnosti koja prijeti svijetu ponovno sa vojnim sukobom. Kako je u Sjedinim državama? Spominje li se uopće ta mogućnost i ta opasnost od nekakvog novog globalnog rata koji bi se mogao dogoditi? I think it's important to realize the United States is a very large country with a lot of different viewpoints. Um, I think there is certainly a fear of a large war in Europe. Um, there's also a lot of, like, I think, frankly, um, a lack of desire to get pulled into a European war, but also a realization that um, the United States is sort of built into European security architecture at this point through NATO and through, like, sort of post-World War II um, agreements. And I think the majority of the country believes that um, 
Ukraine losing to Russia and being overrun by Russia would be bad for Europe and bad for the world. Um, I don't think that's a universally held view, but it's, a, it's the majority view. I think that the role of sort of global police, which was a little bit um, how the U.S. has seen itself um, in the last like 30, 40 years, I think in a multipolar world with other powers, um, I think that role is being reassessed. And I think every, the entire world's in flux right now. Um, the architecture, sort of the post-World War II architecture of, of Europe and of the world more broadly is changing. And I think no one is sure how it's going to resettle, but it's not the same as it was. Pred Amerikom su izbori i često se spominje kako je Amerika jako podijeljeno društvo. Što biste vi rekli, jesu li doista Sjedinje države tako podijeljene, osjetili se to u svakodnevnom životu? It is. I think that politics are a bit of a spectator sport, people a lot of yelling. I do think though that there's quite a lot of noise, like the loudest voices get the most attention and so you have people on the left and the right who are extremely loud and very, um, they emphasize political divisions. But there is a lot of people who don't make as much noise, who are just living their lives. And um, those folks honestly all want the same things. You know, like everybody else in the world, they want safe schools, they want affordable housing, they want um, normal, comfortable lives with decent jobs. And um, I think in that, you know, the whole country is, is, is unified and kind of underneath the noise. Um, and American elections have been closely divided for a long time and I think they will probably continue to be so. U Hrvatsku ste došli iz Velike Britanije gdje ste također predstavili svoj roman. Um, kako je prošlo predstavljanje u Velikoj Britaniji i kako je britanska publika reagirala na roman? I mean, people seem to like it. I, I did a tour in Great Britain. I had people come. Um, there's obviously a, a lot of interest in World War I in that part of the world and um, I think people were interested in what I have to say. Um, a book, it takes a long time, I think, in some ways to know how a book is received because um, however many people want to read it in the first week is usually dependent on sort of marketing, right? The, the, the things, the, the, the publicity for the book, whereas it takes, you know, a year, two years to know if people um, connect to it in a more long term or more like, deeper level. So I guess we'll see. I, I hope people... Um, like and appreciate what I tried to do. But you never know with books. You're always writing something that seems true to you, that pleases you, and you just have this hope that others will also see something in it. But you never know. Um, and if you think too hard about it, you might go a little crazy. So it is important to write books for yourself at the end of the day. And um, just you finish them and you let them go into the world. And um, that's that. It's like, a, it's like a pigeon, you know? Živite u velikoj zemlji i sigurno nije lako napisati prvi roman i opće se probiti. Kako je taj vaš put izgledao? Koliko je teško napisati, a onda i objaviti prvi roman da uopće ugleda svjetlo dana i da dođe do publike u jednoj zemlji kao što su Sjedinjene države? Oh, interesting. That's a good question. Um, is it... I... I don't think it's harder than anywhere else, I would imagine. Um, it takes several steps. Um, and the first step is to write the book and finish it. And so writing your first book is this act of faith because you don't know if anyone will ever want to publish it. So you write your book and then you have this process where you look for a literary agent and literary agents, um, you, don't, you don't pay them. They take a percentage of your earnings. And so the agent has to believe in you as a writer And so if you find an agent, then their job is to talk to editors who are people working at publishing houses and see if the editor wants the book. And if they do, they have to convince their bosses and their colleagues to want the book too. And once they've convinced them, they offer you a contract and then the contract happens and they have this whole like editing process where they fix the book. And then it goes hopefully into print and goes into stores. And then you try to convince people to read it. <laughs> and so you're always trying to convince somebody to read and like your book. And it's this whole process. But um, I wrote my first book in the summer of 2011. So I had just finished uh, university. And um, I got my first publishing contract in 2014. So it took about three years to get a contract. And then the first book came out in the US in 2017. So that, it kind of takes a while. Um, and I think actually my, my, my path was 
not the longest. They're people who work much longer to get to the point of being published. And then you have to get sort of to a point where you can make it your whole living versus doing it as your side job. So it's, it's a long process of building a publishing career. Je li uopće moguće živjeti onda od književnosti, od pisanja u Sjedinim državama? No, I mean, I, I do. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of my friends do as well. Um, it's, it takes time because you want to build up books that are still selling and um, earning royalties, which is a percentage of sales. Um, but I, I definitely know plenty of people that do, and it's just a question of of obviously hard work and some luck as well, I think, and um, not giving up, because it does take time, I think is the biggest thing. A kakav je položaj pisca u društvu? Jesu li pisci poznate osobe? Dajete li intervjue? Nastupate li u javnom prostoru? Kako to funkcionira? I mean, I, I do have public appearances. I do give interviews. I give talks. Um, uh, celebrity is a big word, and I think, the, I think just in general, um, like, actors or celebrities. The nice thing about being an author is even if your books are well known, your face isn't. And so I know authors who are very well known authors, but nobody actually knows what they look like. Mm -hmm. So they can just like do life um, without being harassed. Um, but it's funny because as a writer for 90% of your time, you're at home, maybe in your pajamas, like writing your book at your desk. Um, I have my dog. And then the last 10% of the time, you have to go outside, but not just like normal outside. You have to be like extroverted, like be on, give interviews, um, try to impress people, try to sound normal. Um, and it's a strange contrast between like at home, at home, at home, working by yourself to like many people all the time and then back to being at home by yourself. So it's a weird, it's a weird job. Yeah. A čitali se puno u Sjedinim državama onda? I think so. I mean, I love to read. I know so many readers. Um, it's, I think it's like everything else, the world's changed and there's so many things competing for people's time. There's, there's Netflix, there's TikTok, there's social media generally, there's phones in, in your face, um, but there is a, definitely a place for books and readers. And I think especially the rise of audiobooks has brought in people who don't like reading words, but they um, love to listen. And audiobooks are a bigger and bigger part of the book market, I think in part because people like to listen when they're washing dishes or when they're driving to work or whatever, so. Pripremate li neku novu knjigu, neki novi roman? I am preparing a new book. I have a new book, um, it's set in the modern day. I wanted to do a book with no research because I needed to a little break from research and um, I'm also writing a new book for children as well. So I have a couple of projects going. I have no idea if they like my book or not, but they've been wonderful as people. I have met some lovely, lovely um, people and readers and librarians in the last like few days and everyone's been so kind and I had my first burek and it was really good. <laughs> um, and um, I've had a lovely time. This was my first um, sunny tour stop at all because it was snowing in New York, it was raining in Texas, it was raining in Seattle, it was raining in London, and it is no longer raining. So I am very happy to be in the sunshine. Nadam se da će hrvatska publika nastaviti otkrivati vaše romane i da ćete nas i ponovno posjetiti. Najljepša vam hvala što ste bili naša gošća. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Hvala i vama, dragi gledatelji. Novi razgovor s razlogom čeka vas već za tjedan dana. Do tada, doviđenja.